Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, absolutely delighted you to welcome to this um, grassroots football special as part of the Football Collective series. Um, I'm Dan Parnell, I'm joined by Anthony May, Ryan Thomas and Andy Carmichael and we're going to talk about different aspects of, of grassroots football. Um, just one minute, then quickly, uh, kick off with Anthony, go to Ryan, then Andy, just, just do, who, who are you and where do you work and a little bit about yourself. Hang on, there's a bit of delay. Um, but yeah, I'm Anthony May. Um, I work at Coventry University. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in sport management there. Um, mainly interested at the moment in semi-pro game, how that's going to adapt to um, some fairly significant changes people are probably aware of. Um, so yeah, that's that's my main interest. And other interest is listening to other people's ideas. I'm, I'm as much here to, to listen as to yap on, really. Okay, I'll fire in then. Um, hello everyone, I'm Ryan Thomas. I'm from the sunny southwest Plymouth Marjon University. Um, currently a senior expert in sports development and coaching. I um, used to be a centre of excellence coach, a coach educator um, and a football development officer as well. So I'm kind of coming in from that angle too. Um, doing some research around um, networks and relationships in academy football at the moment uh, as part of my PhD. Um, so. I'll probably end up talking quite a lot about networks with regards to community football as well. So that's who I am. Okay, well, I'm Andy Carmichael. Um, I guess my, my background to this is in sports turf. Did a degree in sports turf and then drifted into agriculture for a bit, but came back to do sports turf research, lecturing, advising. I still do a little bit of that freelance. I write articles and do a bit of pitch assessment. But I got into the environmental management of sports turf, which kind of took me into a PhD that looked at behaviour and, and ultimately social practices, which is when I kind of fell in with you guys. Um, so I guess at heart, I'm sort of a, a scientist who kind of took a wrong turn to the lab one day and isn't entirely sure where he's going. I'm, I'm pretty much a, a gun for hire, if you like, because... Um, I'm, I'm working for UCLan at the moment on a tourism project, but uh, if anybody wants to save me from a lifetime of bus routes and things like that, then please shout out, I'm, I'm available. Okay, brilliant. Um, to, to, thanks very much, chaps. To start us off then, and maybe we'll start with, start with you, Andy, and I'll we'll work back our way back to Andy. Just give us two minutes. And what grassroots, everyone views grassroots football as, as different and we define it differently. So how would you define grassroots football, Andy? Um, I, I don't uh, really. I, I, I try and avoid the word wherever possible. I probably used it in that article I wrote for the collective the other day, but I, I always try not to simply because it is such a broad description. I, I think that the thing that kind of killed it for me it was a few years ago the, in the FA Awards they awarded the, the grassroots club of the year to uh, I think it was Notts County ladies who at the time were a professional club and, and funded and I, I just couldn't relate that to the world that I knew I mean in, in my work I, I sort of use the term community football because that's that's where I've been so while I can go out and do a, a pitch assessment on a on a team who's sort of fairly well known from the, the first round or two of the FA Cup, like say Bishop Auckland, most of my kind of work and, and life in football, where it might be a, a club with 20 youth sides playing on a, quite a big extensive site, but he's mainly voluntary, um, sort of relies on, on grant funding, he's, he's very local. Um, all the supporters tend to be the parents. That's my kind of grassroots, if you like, because that's where I see the sort of the future generation coming, not from the kind of single team, one pitch, well, dog and duck FC, as I described them the other day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I did participate in research in, in a community football club for my PhD, and I stayed on and I've, I've ended up becoming a trustee and I've got involved that way. Um, so that's very much my world, the kind of 
up to the age of 18 kind of football. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. I'd echo some of that too. What does it, what does it mean to, to you, Ryan? Do you know what? I might drop an early bomb in um, and just say, um, depends how we define community, I suppose. Um, if we're using the term like maybe community football, we're using community as a term that a group of people with shared experiences, then it probably could mean anything to, to many people. For me, it's probably those very light pay packets at semi-pro level down uh, towards uh, people who are playing recreationally, perhaps on publicly owned um, pitches, and um, certainly a lot of the, the grassroots game, at, um, so the youth game at, um, you know, that we see on these kind of council pitches all up and down the country. If I was going to put it in, in one term, I'd say it's probably the beating heart of football in this country. It sounds a bit cheesy, but it really is. Um, that's probably what community football and grassroots football means to me. It's a place where people come together with shared experiences and actually form relationships beyond their original intention of playing football. Okay, great. Anthony, what what does yeah. how, how do you define grassroots football? Um fairly similar to, to Ryan, really. Um I'm not, I'd, I'd like to use cheesier terms, but I'm not sure I can. Um, but yeah, probably um, anyways, so looking at semi-pro football um, and not not the level where we like professional football. So I think is a national league, north and south. Um, so I think for me, we're starting to look below that level. I mean, there's obviously some pretty um, hefty budgets um, that I'm going to be less interested in the very very low level um, although I do have an interest in um, I'm more interested in semi pro football and yeah it is to do with community albeit that's kind of an elastic term um, and we can use it um, as, as, we, as we see fit um, so I think my definition and Ryan's definition are actually fairly similar. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. To, to move it on then, and we'll come to you, Ryan, first. Maybe just give us an insight on your research and what are the issues um, in relation to your research that we're experiencing in grassroots football at the minute? Yeah, um, a lot of my research at the moment is looking, I mean, admittedly is on academy football, but I think I'm beginning to apply it to the grassroots game as well through some of my previous roles um, and also from the perspective of, of a parent of a young child that takes part in grassroots football regularly. And um, my work's looking at kind of networks, relationships, ties uh, between different people within certain environments. And um, I think for me at the moment with regards to grassroots football, it'd be very easy just to say, well, there's no football happening. So therefore those relationships are lost. Um, I think the biggest issue um, would be that some of the larger clubs, and when I say larger, I mean in terms of they, they have a much sort of greater mass of individuals within that club, a much stronger base of volunteers. They might be linked to universities. They might be linked to senior professional sides that own their own ground and have lots of hospitality and catering and sort of bar facilities. I think those kind of organisations, um, that's where the interactions are really missed because on a regular basis, uh, on a weekend, people are coming together, not just for the game, but just to mix in groups of friends. Um, that might be sort of sausage and chips in the clubhouse after the game. It might be a cup of tea from, um, you know, just a, 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 and a bacon butty um, on, a, on a pitch side sort of caravan. Regardless, those things, um, I think, are, are the interactions that, that people are missing at the moment uh, with regards to football. And these are the things that certainly in our WhatsApp group with our parents and what people are craving. I think the thing that I really worry about are those clubs that literally turn up on a council pitch, um, play their game and go home. There are, there are very little interactions in those situations anyway. And I think I worry about um, the volunteers and I worry about the experience of those children. Um, I think the keen ones may end up going to some of these better clubs um, because of the fact that we're craving, we see the importance of, relationships formed through community football um, but I think uh, longer term I, I worry about those clubs that have very limited resources and facilities. 
Yeah, that's a, a really interesting one. And with my under 12 grassroots boys football team, we, we're trying everything in our right mind to keep us connected via WhatsApp and little activities they can do from painting stones to watching Michael Jordan's last dance, everything at the minute. They, they ended up watching Space Jam last night, so I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> I think they but, win. But one of, I mean, one of the... One of, the, one of the things that stands out, do you think that some kids just might not come back? Because some of the things that you're going to talk about and some of the things Andy's going to talk about definitely mm -hmm. is like they're having, a, they're having a, a poor experience and maybe it's going to turn them away in the long run. Yeah, well, I'm, what I'm noticing is that coaches um, seem to be really divided in terms of the ones I speak to. There are some that are on Zoom literally every other day, putting on sessions, you know, whether they're synchronous or not. Um, and providing those kind of interactions and that regular contact with their players. There's others that have spoken to me and said, you know what, I'm just delighted not to be doing this. I, I've avoided the um, selection of the team for the end of season festival. I've, uh, I've avoided the, the worry about the end of season awards. There were a few people that were beginning to just kind of get on my nerves and trying to get me to join the committee. Um, so many of those have actually said, you know what, this is great. I'm relaxing and I'm, I'm not interacting with the players perhaps as much as I should. But I'm actually finding that quite cathartic. Um, is that okay, Ryan? So of course it's okay. Um, I don't tend to really worry about those, but I think what I do worry about are those volunteers that were almost clinging on in the first place. They weren't necessarily well supported by their club. The facilities were poor. There was a struggle to get kids there every week. And I think during this kind of period of relaxation almost, I think one or two may be beginning to question whether they want to stay at that club which may end up seeing the club wither and die, um, or whether they stop altogether. Really, really interesting one from the volunteer perspective in terms of how much goodwill is in the bank, how much capital is there already, and how much strain can that take. Fascinating, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, from your team, um, you know, know a little bit about, you, about your research, and you know, arguably some of your research has lights on why we've been missing a bit of football anyway in normal periods of time because of, uh, the pitch conditions and maybe we just tell us a little bit more about about the research that you've done and what are the what are the existence and current issues that that face for grassroots football in that area or you know community recreational football well um, i mean uh, up here um it's interesting the other day uh, i don't know if he's on but but paddy mentioned something about the contrast between um where he is and, and the gaa and how he talked about how the GAA had their land sort of secured. So they knew that nothing was happening to that and, and it gave them a home. And that's, that's what it's like up in the, the, the Northeast. There's, there's a very high level of, of council ownership of the facilities up here. You get a lot of ex colliery welfare pitches, that kind of thing. Um, and, and part of the problem is the councils just simply can't afford to, to look after them. And like Ryan was saying, there's quite a few clubs that are nomadic. You know, we need a pitch for Saturday. OK, you've got that one. And the under 11s might never see the under 10s. They might never see, the, you know, they, they try and hold some sort of event at the end of the season. But they're effectively a dozen teams just playing wherever they can go. Um, and then you've got clubs like mine that do have a home. We've got seven pitches. We've asset transferred the, the, the site. We're responsible for everything and we can actually start to build things there you know we we have got a, a a kind of um a focal point for everybody and and we get involved with with the rest of the community by hiring out the facilities for various activities um put on the you know the stroke football and the walking football that kind of thing and and i think ryan's right i, th I think for those kind of nomadic clubs it, it's difficult to see what the future is going to be like. I mean, I, I went into them and started sort of saying, right, environmental management, you know, what, what can we talk about? And they, they all just held up their hands and said, well, we, we don't own anything. We're not even allowed to mark out the pitch. It, it, you, you're way too premature with that. You know, they, there's, until we have that kind of control and, and that, that um, ability to, to set things up and, and have a home and, um, and to do things ourselves, then we can't even begin to look at these issues. But part of the problem is you can't just take the land off the council's hand because it's so expensive to manage pitches. 
Um, I mean, we're, we're on replacing the, the 3G at our place at the end of the month, and it's, well, it's currently 85,000 to replace the 3G, but we, we've got to do it. Well, some of these clubs, there's, there's just no way they, they, can't, they can't do that, which is why I advanced the argument that some pitches should be allowed to, to go when others should have the investment in them. I mean, really interesting. Within my club, the Shaftesbury Youth Club, uh, that resides next to Tramway Rovers, we've got a long-term lease on our playing fields, and the biggest it, it was at Borough Road, and it's been been left and just cut for many years. But since when we took over it, we the one thing we did do is is clear the drains, right? And we cleared the drains, and the pitches are probably the best pitches in the world at the minute at a grassroots yeah. level, and it's been incredible. Do you, do you see that there's a need then for Maybe is there a way of transferring some of the ownership of these pitches towards clubs, or is that not enough? Is that do they need more support around what? I mean, we were lucky; one of our members had a had a digger and could do this and you volunteered to do this work. But yeah, do they need more support beyond just resources and beyond just our oh, here's the pitches? I, I I think so. I mean, the, there was some research up here came out in Northumbria, um, and they looked at. Um, Sort of leisure facilities across the area that had been transferred out of council control and that there wasn't any kind of particular plan um, with that in mind i mean the, the fa did come up with a guide to asset transfers but it was just the legal how do we do that and and what happens after that there's no it, it's pretty much up to the kind of the nouse and the canniness and the the local skills that you've got access to and and the kind of things i mean for example you know we're quite lucky that we've got quite a few builders as parents of, of players you know you, you love them and we've got a guy who likes nothing better than sitting on a mower it, it's things like that it's it's not as straightforward as just saying right we'll take the pitch because particularly if the pitch has been in a, in a, a bad condition, then you need to invest quite a lot of time and effort. And then you, you potentially get stuck in that situation. I don't know what it's, it's like with you, but up here, the rugby and the cricket clubs can do quite well because they've got function suites and they get to do birthday parties and funerals and all of that kind of stuff. Um, whereas the football clubs don't have as much as that. I mean, we... We definitely suffer as a club financially because we don't have a bar, but that's a deliberate choice. We don't want alcohol anywhere near the the kids and and the well the parents in particular. Um, whereas cricket and rugby has a slightly different model and and they can start to generate their own funds. Um, if we didn't continue with with grant funding and, and <laughs> clever arrangements, then there's just no way we could we could support the pitch pitch development. Really interesting. I, I almost, it makes me, I'm coming to you next, Anthony, but it makes me think of Ryan's networks and maybe we need to be more selective about how we identify parents to make sure we've got yeah. builders, <laughs> talent, yeah. um, you know, pe you know, quite a, you know, talent ID, but on another level to, to secure the financial sustainability of our football. Well, it, yeah. so, certainly at our club, the, the, the guy who's the leader is quite canny. He, he recruits people to be trustees who he thinks can be potentially useful. Um, so one of them's a solicitor, another <laughs> one's head of something at, at Gateshead College. You, you know, he, he, he chooses people that he thinks, oh, you, you'll be good on a letterhead, you know? So, so yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that. You know, yeah, your, your kid's actually better than we thought because your dad can replace the windows. Yeah, it's, it's uh, spot on. Um, okay, really good insight so far. And Anthony, you, you've been you've been researching this for, for, for quite some time now, and I know you've got not just a research interest, but also that, that the passion for grassroots football as well. But from your your analysis and your reflections, Anthony, what, what would be the standout issues that you can see in grassroots football at the minute? Um. Oh, by the way, is this working better now? Can you hear me properly? Much better. Sounds that's good. Yeah, I've had some move rooms like, through the keyhole, but um. Mostly sustainability, to be honest. I think well, the some of the issues that Ryan and Andy have been talking about are to do, in part at least, with how sustainable these clubs actually are. Um, and it's difficult to be 
sustainable, even at the level of having your own facilities, being able to make a little bit of money over the bar. Um, I'm interested in things sort of wider than that, and I can see why clubs wouldn't want to go down that route. But it's going to be uh, challenging, I'd have thought, for a lot of clubs at certainly sort of lower semi-pro level and, and grassroots more generally um, to stay um, in business potentially. So they're going to need, I would have thought, to diversify um, or at least to try and attract um, people not just through the football offer, but through other ways that you can get people through the door. Um, obviously, the paper that we did in the past, Dan, we looked at the impacts of having a 3G pitch, which I know not everybody's in favour of by any means. I think there are issues there with maybe with, with the playing surface for, for the semi-pro club, but as a way of getting people through the door and interacting with your club, um, maybe getting involved in, in a way that they wouldn't have imagined. Maybe they'd be attracted to watch the club. It's not a bad it's not a bad way in. If you can get people that are interested in football anyway, and then you can maybe get them to pay however much it is for a ticket, um, even a few times, you, that's money you wouldn't otherwise have made in an environment that's really competitive. We've got a huge number of semi-pro clubs. Some people might argue we've got too many, but I don't really need the Twitter hate, so I'm not saying that. Um, but yeah, um, I think sustainability for me is the key. That's what I'm going to try um, post this particular period um, to look into in a lot more detail is what are good models of sustainability? How can clubs attract, keep um, their supporters? And also it concerns me a little bit um, if we're going to go down the road of um, having useful parents. How are academics useful parents? Um, I don't like this network model at all. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and stop it at this point. No one's putting me on a letterhead, so <laughs> I need to stop that. Um, doesn't surprise you, Auntie, that I, I'm a trustee as well. You know, <laughs> I, uh, it, it's all, yeah. it's all, it's all downhill. Not after I this year, not mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting the idea of sustainability. But I think some of, some of the, our local clubs have received criticism because they've had to fundraise, and I've almost had to speak to a few few friends to say, you know, no one, even the best leaders in the world, aren't necessarily prepared for crises like this. Um, so we've seen some really positive reactions where clubs have used social media and also had this collective identity belonging to engage with all the players. And one of the recent, I mean, one of the recent ones we've suggested we're going to get all the players to. I think walk the length of England uh, collectively. Uh, so it's little things like that that helps bring that identity. So as a club, which you're trying to do a little bit more to bring people closer, and I guess it's building on your stuff right around relationships too uh, during this, this this challenging period. If it, if it's been it slightly now, and I'm going to say like I'm going to ask us to, to to jump forward and say you know what needs to be done during this time or in the future. In the in the broader football economy, to put things right and put things in a better place for your area of interest in grassroots football. So, if, does that make sense, Ryan? Are you right to start with that? Yeah, um, I think my first thought is probably. I mean, the conversation seems to be talking quite a lot about um, appropriate spaces for these kind of interactions and relationships to build and to occur, and we worry about those nomadic teams with the really poor facilities and the lack of conversation about. Oh, yeah, I know a builder who can do X, Y, and Z. So for me, how that starts, I mean, councils are going to have even less money over the next probably decade, which means pitches are going to be really difficult to maintain. And I think um, Andy makes a really good point about the number of pitches that we should be looking to invest in and improve. The obvious place to start would be a resetting of the whole football um, kind of structure in terms of starting with the Premier League. This is obviously a grassroots discussion, but wouldn't it be great if the... Uh, 5% broadcasting fee was reintroduced. Um, well, it used to be, what, 5% of 300, 350 million? It's now a set fee. If we can get 5% of 5 billion, then that could be used for real grassroots community football hubs. Um, that could be, um, for me, that would be a, a great start of building meaningful relationships at a local level with local people driving and running those facilities for local good. Is there, um, is there, is there a problem, and this, is, this goes to all of us, to 
always look towards the Premier League. And, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is, and I mean, as we go through this, you know, for me, one of the deep burning things is that why are we waiting? Why do we have to go to the Premier League cap and hand to ask these questions from this this really powerful capitalist beast that we we have helped create? Why why are we not looking towards government to answer these questions? Or is it that we just know it's hopeless going to government? Mm-hmm. Uh, our only hope is the Premier League. I, I, I don't know. Might depends who's in government. Uh, I think that might help um, without going too political. <laughs> um, you're right. I think we do go to the Premier League too often. Um, I, I think there's no getting away from the fact that it's an absolute beast of an organisation, though, and probably could do more good than it is currently doing. Acknowledge that they do fund community trusts. Um, through some of their own programs um, quite generously. Um, but I would argue how much of that is is with current players, i.e. kids from local football clubs turning up to community trust run facilities uh, and activities, and how much is driving brand new participation. Uh, and I think community clubs are ideally placed to do that. Um, for, for me, those spaces are really important. Um, and that's not going to happen with local voluntary community clubs perhaps doing that on their own unless they're very lucky to have the right network within their clubs. Okay, 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 brilliant. Well, you can save the politics and we'll go to Anthony. Because Anthony, you do not have to save, save the politics. So uh, we, we've got like some sh- shared thinking about this and uh, my general my general idea, um, my general thoughts around some of this is that the Premier League do so much and yet they could do more, we could all do more personally uh, as a community, as organisations, and, and the things that we do in our, our day to day, I also, I also think that um, we need to also recognise if some of that work hadn't gone on, what state would we be in now? And I think we've got to acknowledge the good work that has gone on, whilst asking for more if that's what we're going to do, but also asking, right, well, why are we in this situation in the first place? Who's who is creating this environment where we're becoming so reliant on people to get handouts? So, so, so Anthony, my, my question to you is, you know, how, what is that? You know, it might be a little bit of a nod towards the, the political landscape, but also, you know, who should we be looking to, and who should we be asking questions to, and what do those questions look like, or what do the solutions look like? Uh, easy, simple easy, on that. easy one for you. I was going to say, Dan, yeah, nice and simple that. Um, First of all, I, I kind of I agree with Ryan that it would be kind of nice if we if it felt like we had a government that we're likely to care. Um, I think that's what he said. Um, also, um, who should we we should acknowledge that the Premier League and Championship do some good work. I think we do need to acknowledge that that's the case. That there are people um, working at those clubs or at foundations um, attached to those clubs who really do care about the, the wider community, they are doing good work. And yeah, we definitely need to acknowledge that. Um, there is more that they could do for sure. Um, I think maybe we're looking towards hope, a big, big hope, I think for, probably for many of us that might be interested in this sort of conversation, is that the landscape might shift a little bit um, away from a kind of greed is good ethos perhaps um, towards looking towards your neighbour a little bit more because um, as Ryan mentioned participation with sort of the majority um, of us um, I've accepted it now and not going to be uh, professional footballers um, we might play to try and stay fit we might play for social reasons we might still be pretty good and, and be able to play to a reasonable level but those people are as important or actually more important in many ways than the professionals that fill the papers, fill the social media every day. These are the kinds of people that um, any sport actually relies on. And um, so it's impossible to have like a top level, a top echelon and then nothing underneath it at all. That's completely, um, to use a word I've used too many times, that's not sustainable at all. Um, you do need um, a, a good grassroots base. I think probably we'd all agree that that would be true. Um, there's a number of ways of, of getting that in, in position. Um, I think clubs probably need to be a little bit more agile. Um, not all of them, but some of them um, probably need to be a little bit more savvy towards getting and being accepting of new ideas and new, new communities to get involved. 
Um, there are certain communities that aren't involved as much in grassroots football, certainly, as they should be. Cricket has the same problem, rugby union has the same problem as well. Um, we need to be as welcoming as we possibly can um, from that point of view. Um, I think if we were waiting for government to help at the moment, I think we'd be waiting a long time. Um, there are probably bigger priorities at the moment than football, um, which is probably as it should be, really. Um, and yeah, waiting for councils. I mean, I'm, I'm sat here in Birmingham at the moment, and I think the chances of Birmingham City Council having a significant fund for sports are, are relatively remote. Um, so some of this we're going to need to do ourselves. Um, if we're interested in building communities, it has to begin with us, really. And then any help we can get financially um, is, is a real bonus. Thanks, Anthony. I love that. I love that idea of obviously looking to us. And I also, you know, Danny's, Danny Fitzpatrick's on the line, and we talked in the last session about the, the, the idea of contributing to a couple of pieces around, you know, what change might look like to the DCMS call for, for evidence. And I mean, two questions. First off, do, do we bother? Is it, is it worth it? Um, and second off, if we did, what would be the one big substantial change that you think, you know what, if we're going to drive something through, this is what it might look like? Again, I'm giving you the easiest question today. So, Yeah, it's, it, it, it's good. Um, I've had a lot of preparation as well. So, um, what should, I think we've got to, we can't, it's nice obviously to talk among, among friends, um, among like-minded people and put ideas forward um we do we probably do need to try and speak to power if we can um whether we get a receptive audience is different but it's hard to say that you didn't get an audience if you don't try um we might have our suspicions about how receptive they are to be but we still got to try as a community um to get our point across if there's an invite to do that then take advantage um Second question, what was it, Dan? It's about if there was something that we were going to put forward, and obviously this this is going to take more for, but if there's anything that stood out for me that you thought, actually, if we did this, if there could be a significant impact. Um, we need to, to try and, we need to be able to evidence positive impacts, whether that's a social impact, a community impact. I don't necessarily think um, that being able to solve evidence of sporting impact would be enough. I don't think it's the sort of sporting impact that funders at that level are necessarily going to care about. They're probably, despite how nebulous it can be, the link between sport and positive social impacts, I do think that's the sort of thing that, if possible, we'd have to try and evidence to say, look, if you invest in this, the posit there's positive results. Um, in some ways, sport becomes quite a cheap tool to use. Um, it can be used quite cynically, but it's still probably, I think anyway, the best, the best chance we've got. I can see Mark is on the line. Um, I'm really interested in what Mark's club do at Whitehawk. And what they do is pretty left field, but it, I think it could be adopted on a, on a wider level. Um, being the heart of a community, whether that's a whole community, I think is a different matter. You can't get everyone. Um, but you can, if you can get like a broad base of activism even, I think that's that's something that's, that's worthwhile. I think it's worth doing. Um, so yeah, maybe our contribution as a community would be to show that we are engaged, that we do care about the community that we're in. We care about society. There is such a thing as society. And, and we we want to make a positive contribution to that. Sorry if I'm um, sorry if I'm jumping in, but I I couldn't agree more. Um, I think one of the things I was thinking of um, in terms of what we do next, one thing that we probably don't do very well, it may be because the expertise just isn't there in many grassroots organisations, is to measure the impact of what we're about. And if this um, period of coronavirus and lockdown has taught us anything is how much we actually value music the arts sport and specifically football and I think we probably need to go beyond the um the usual kind of monitoring and evaluation of football related activities that are just based on numbers of people playing and number of people retaining the game something that highlights the impact of 
relationships and um, kind of mental health uh, provision and, and, and so on and so on. I think it's going to be crucial moving forward. And that may, may help with bottom up funding of grassroots sport. Yeah, okay. that, that's totally agree with that. Yeah, I don't think that we're going to just saying that people are playing football. It's not necessarily going to be enough. There's got to be something else that comes from that, I think. Um, maybe it's not everyone will agree, but yeah, I agree totally with Ryan on that. I think, I think there's a really important thing about looking at the, the economic, but also the social impact of grassroots facilities. And even if we drill that down to even a grassroots pitch, so what is the, you know, someone's got to build a grassroots pitch, someone's got to put it together. It's going to have an impact then, an economic impact of some sort in the community, because that's what clubs do too, as well as a social impact. So I totally agree with that, Paul. We need to do more as, as, as a scholarly group to help give people the evidence to at least have those discussions um, with the evidence behind them. Andy, from, you, from your take, you know, what, what is it that needs to be done then from the, from the, from the perspective of pitches and clubs? Well, when I, when, when I first heard about, um, you'd be familiar with the FA's part life scheme. Well, when that was first mooted a few years back, I thought that that's it, that's the answer. Um, Two seconds, I've got a couple of footballers just walking past. Get off! <laughs> um, yeah, I thought, I thought part life was going to be the answer because the idea that they were going to build like a central hub and it was going to be managed sort of independently and clubs could then have a, a sort of settled place to go and play football and, and the quality would be high and... and it would take it out of that sort of debate as to a, a cash staff council or a club who didn't have the expertise or the funds. I thought that was brilliant. But then somewhere along the line, they seemed to, to change their kind of mission statement or, or maybe it was the, the aim all along. And they became really quite commercial. And, and certainly the, the ones we've got around here, they are expensive. They're not particularly popular with, with some of the people who I've spoken to. And it, it feels like that was a potentially missed opportunity. I mean, wearing my environmental hat, that would have been perfect. You know, one big hub where you could introduce all kinds of, um, to pinch Anthony's words, sustainable features rather than having lots of clubs kind of not able to afford um, updating their facilities. But, but it now feels like um, that's just sort of priced itself out the equation. It's just, yet another central venue where some clubs play rather than being across football you know it, it doesn't feel like it's it's impacted um how the game is is organized and played it's just benefited a few teams who happen to be able to take advantage of it i mean from from my perspective i, I think you have to to step back and look and say well how do we organize the game you know have we got well, I think we've got too many pitches. Um, have we got too many clubs? You know, could we, could, uh, it, it was something I asked and every time I asked somebody, do you think potentially you could merge with that club just over the other side of the pitch? Oh, take it, I needed me tin hat. You know, you don't go around saying things like that because they start saying, oh, back in 1965, that club, you know, and, uh, but you know, you know, if you don't come to football with with all that kind of knowledge and and background and having gone through it myself, you know, I guess somebody would probably say, "You got too many pitches, you got too many clubs. You need to focus your resources like this and this and this." Um, but it's it's hard it's hard to separate that from what it means to people. And and I mean, I I, I got a brilliant quote for me PhD it was I was talking to a guy at a local authority who was responsible for, for the pitches and he hated football really didn't like football at all but it was part of his remit and he said I came up with this brilliant scheme I was going to set aside this land and he said it was going to have good transport links and all the teams could play there and he said and, and what did I hear oh I, I'm not going to give up that pitch because that's where my granddad played and he, he, he didn't get it at all. He didn't get that kind of link. Um, and I think, I think that's something if, if, you know, you read local authorities' pitch playing strategies, they don't necessarily look at that. They, they, they just go, right, you've got this, you've got this, that's your budget, that's what you have to do. 
Um, and I don't, I don't know whether, you know, maybe people in football might have to compromise a little bit on that and say, well, yeah, we are a bit, you know, over-teamed. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's easy to say what's wrong. It's quite difficult to come up with, with solutions, you know? Yeah, I'm with you. I think the, the interesting one that you mentioned there, like around not so much mission drift, but mission shift from, you know, the people start off with these narratives of accessibility, but the tension to remain sustainable becomes that, you know, they move then to different markets and different groups of users. But that's, that's brilliant. Let's, let's open up for questions. Um, we've got first one from, from John Dorr. John, are you there? Hi, Daniel. You okay? Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. camera on. Yeah, I'm just speaking from uh, personal experience, really, at the, the university um, where a colleague of mine who works part time with the FA is based. We've got a rather large grassroots club with 22 um, youth teams, and we're very reliant on the university facilities for both training and also uh, match days. So we face the kind of threat, if you like, of university campuses not being reopen for face-to-face -face teaching until potentially January, uh, which could lead to obviously a situation where we need to try and find facilities uh, for such a vast number of teams. So I just thought, I know there was a lot of talk about council pitches and maintenance of pitches, but I think it goes back to the, the sheer availability of the number of pitches and hubs that we can tap into. Any, anyone want to pick that up? I'll have a go, seeing as I know John. <laughs> Hi Ryan, you okay? Hi John. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a really tricky one because you would think that clubs like, like yours and some of those clubs locally that are connected to the big kind of senior side to be able to ride this kind of store much better because they have that network of people, the expertise, the influence where they can utilise their participation in another network, i.e. I know someone who works for the county FA, I know someone who works for the council, to be able to kind of ride that storm. So I think, although it may seem a bit flippant to say that you're probably going to be better off than many other clubs, um, I think you're right. Um, I, I think the only thing that could happen with these kind of um, university type facilities is that the sports centre may be very separate to maybe sort of teaching buildings. And I think mm. access to those are going to be um, going to be far easier to manage and maintain um, than maybe a classroom. But yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Thank, thanks, Ryan. I, I, I think I will follow that up. So Annie's has asked a question. So my own grassroots club has had emails from our facility provider to ask if we'll be returning next season with a deadline, as they have a short list of organisations. Should facilities be involved in conversations as well as grassroots clubs in terms of access and sustainability too? Any takers on that? I think in short, Anish, I would say yes, 100% they have to be involved in it um, and, and should be involved in it. But is there any comments from the, from the team? Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting one. You've got to wonder, um, I mean, everyone's got to make a living, I suppose. At the moment, I'm, you know, a short list of organisations with a deadline when you don't know if you'll be able to play or not. Feels like uh, it's an interesting email to receive, I should imagine. Um, I think it probably relates a little bit to, to what Ryan and, and John were, were talking about a minute ago. You can't necessarily say, yes, I'm 100% going to be available when you don't know if you're going to be allowed to play, when that's going to start. I think they, they should be involved in these conversations, definitely, but not, they shouldn't be. At the moment, I, I'd be very wary of, of anyone uh, profiteering, and, and you would hope that none of that would happen, um, would be all I would have to say on that. We, we really need to avoid. Um, while there are budgets to consider, hopefully, Across the whole sector, you would hope that no, um, no unfair deadlines are, are set for clubs. It'd be interesting. It's... Sorry, I was just going to say it'd be interesting to know which which other organisations might be back and running and doing whatever they're going to do on on football facilities before football. 
I mean, as far as we, we've had the conversation as a club and, and we've said until the schools are sorted and, and back up and running as normal as possible, we're not going to touch it simply because we run effectively like a school, you know, 300 kids on a weekend and, you know, four training sessions every night. And I don't know what, interesting to know who, who's going to move in on, on football facilities and, and do whatever they do. I think, the, I think the unknown there is that schools and universities may return, but they may they will re be returning with physical distancing. So yeah. to expect it to transfer to football, returning at a grassroots level, you know, we, we could be a long way off. Um, good, good questions. Uh, Danny Fitzpatrick? I'm on just starting video. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was um, but it has been a very, very interesting discussion. So, uh, thanks to all the panel for it. I think obviously one of the themes that, that you've kind of spoken to is around sustainability. And I suppose thinking about grassroots football and thinking about especially what you said, Andy, was maybe there's a bit of a tension between the social sustainability in the fact that if you want to engage a community, it helps if they have some kind of ownership, some autonomy, some stake in that club. They feel that that club means something, represents something. But maybe there's a bit of a, a tension, a conflict there with the environmental sustainability. But that, that was it, comments. My, my question is really about, the other thing that's kind of come up is about the support to clubs. Or some clubs fare better if they've got certain types of expertise that they can draw on in terms of their volunteers and kind of wider um, stakeholders and it kind of got me thinking back to the whole debate around the football task force and the reasons why supporters direct were introduced to enable and support groups of people who wanted to take kind of support or led ownership of clubs now that wasn't really focused obviously on the kind of the real grassroots level and um, I suppose it's part of the FA's remit to support that process but if that isn't happening, my question would be, is one of the things that you need to put to, towards government that there needs to be some other new body introduced that provides that kind of expertise, that advice and guidance at that really low level about maybe community asset transfer or about how you engage a community. Those kind of real kind of everyday kind of mundane questions and, and, and kind of the more kind of technical ones as well. Does it need to be something else, another kind of body that does that? If I, if I outline how the pitch side of thing works, it, it, as far as I'm con aware, that there isn't an equivalent on the other side of, of running a club. Mm. But if, um, by the way, if, if any of you involved in clubs and you haven't put in your, your bid for five grand before Friday, get it done now. You can get, fill in a form, you'll get money. Um, Basically, if a, if a club is worried about the state of their pitches or they, they need a bit of help or they've got a particular problem, they get in touch with the local FA. Mm -hmm. The local FA get in touch with an organisation called the Grounds Management Association. And I'm one of their sort of extended network of, of pitch advisors. Um, and they have a regional advisor. Um, and one of us will go out, we'll talk to the club, we'll have a look at the pitch, see what the problem is, drainage or there's no grass or, or whatever it might be we do an assessment which takes about an hour and then we send that to the local fa if that says yes there's a problem this is what i recommend you need to do this this and this that then gets forward to to the football foundation and opens up a, a, a whack of different sort of funding streams whether it be the club hasn't got the right machinery to look after the pitch or whether they need to initiate particular repairs um, to say the drainage or, or whatever it might be and then generally you know if they fill the forms in they do everything correctly and and they can prove that they've got tenure and a, a plan in place to maintain it then they'll get the funding and then 18 months or so later me or one of my colleagues will go back um, do an assessment and we'll say yes that pitch has now improved 
tick that one off, it goes on the FA's records and then they can say we have improved X playing surfaces in the last 18 months. Um, and it works really well. And, and um, as by and large, the, the, the old system wasn't like that. It was just kind of put in a form, here's some money, there you go. Oh dear, it didn't work. Um, but I'm not aware of anything that would be similar on, say, the facility side of things. You know, if, if somebody said, we've got a big old building here that we pay a fortune to heat and light and it's not generating enough money, can you help us? I, I, I don't know. I mean, there might be somebody who, who does that. But as, as far as I know, there isn't. Um, and you think, any, well, um, potentially there, there could be. Any quick comments from Ryan and Anthony on that one? I think um, the obvious place normally is the county FA. They tend to obviously take care of any kind of grassroots development of, you know, development of grassroots facilities. I think they're working with a fairly limited pot of money. Um, I think there's obviously only so much they can do. I mean, in our county, the county development manager kind of takes care of all of that, that his, his job is effectively facilities and manage the rest of the football development team. Um, I think they're going to have quite a big job to do um, after all of this. Um, to kind of work with clubs to be able to navigate through some of these issues because like we said at the start um, those that do rely on publicly owned facilities are going to be battling some really you know, substandard surfaces for a while I think. And? Yeah Danny were you asking as well about you mentioned supporters direct so we're we looking at the, the management level of clubs as well kind of trying to get more more people involved with a wider range of expertise perhaps. Yeah, I was just kind of using supporters direct as a, I suppose as an example or an analogy because I suppose that originally also fell under the purview of the FA, but there was it was felt at the time that it, the FA wasn't doing enough to further that particular kind of movement or cause within football, and yeah. it just strikes me that, and I know I know that's in some ways that's the fundamental role of the FA to support grassroots football. But what we're saying is, it's not a problem of supply, because what we're talking about is that there's too many teams. So the problem is that there's too many people that want to play football, and there are there isn't the spaces to play them on, or there's, it, it's not sustainable for financial reasons or because people kind of fall out of the love of kind of supporting that club. So it's not a problem of supply. So it's got to be. I mean, it's not a problem of demand. It's got to be a problem of supply. So it was just whether, I suppose. Can the county FAs do do things differently? Is it just a question of funding, or does an, a, a body which is exclusively interested in grassroots football and only grass football need to be introduced? And um, would that help, or would that just kind of make things more complex? I suppose. Um, if I suppose like any other sort of governance issue, it very much depends on the quality of the people involved. Um, I would, I think, maybe the. The FA, well, we'll see what the FA's priorities are over the next year or so. Whether the priority is bring back the Premier League, bring back the Premier League, and we don't really care about too much else, or whether it's going to be an investment and participation, and hopefully the latter. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether there'd be um, a case to bring in another um, layer of, of governance um, and whether there'd be money to do it mm. as well. But there definitely needs to be more of a focus on, as you, as you said rightly and, and we've heard, that plenty of people want to play. Whether they've got the opportunities that they should have is, is a different question, despite the numbers of clubs that we have and the numbers of facilities um, that we have as well, albeit some not amazing quality. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, if, if that, I wouldn't rule that out as something that might work. Um, it just be a question of who sits on it and what their levels of expertise are, I think. Okay, brilliant. It's almost I can see something like that, Danny, also just helping these clubs organise, just to have a voice and to be able to influence beyond themselves as well. Yeah, I suppose that it was kind of you know, to act as a bit of an advocate as well. I'm not kind of saying that the FA doesn't do any of these things, but as Anthony said, the FA has so many different priorities and has a number of different conflicts of interest to do with the the wider governance of the game and it just seems that we rely on individuals or groups of individuals or you know particular motivated MPs 
to kind of speak for grassroots football, it, it doesn't really have an institutionalised political voice that, that, that I see. Um, it, you know, the FA does do that in part, but... Okay, Dan, Dan, Danny's had a moment asking questions. <laughs> yeah, Danny, Danny's empty chaired himself. <laughs> that was the best thing I've seen in ages. Brilliant. Uh, if, we've got, if everyone's okay, we've got one last question, question from Stephen yeah. Rob, Rob, Robertson. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how on earth you follow that. Um, <laughs> just leave, Steve. <laughs> my, my, my question is, is kind of based on parents as coaches. I mean, Ryan was talking earlier about the importance of the network. Um, and one of the things that when I was involved originally with my, my daughter's club, you know, it was that thing, you got involved because your, your kid is playing and then as your kid moves up the age level, so do you. For sustainability purposes, do we have to kind of break that cycle? We, uh, we, we deliberately try to at our club uh, simply because we've had so many problems in the past with parents getting a bit possessive and, and trying to build little empires around the team. Um, I mean, the, the, the guy who runs our club, the club's been running since the 50s and uh, he's been involved since, well, about 1960. Um, he, he's always held that it always works best if you have an independent coach of the team, even if that means swapping the nine-year-old's dad up to the 11-year-old team and, and vice versa mm -hmm. because of the potential for parents to say, well, his kid, you know, is getting chosen and yet he's, he's not one of the best. The only problem is, again, if you start having multi-site football, it can mean that, that the parent's there and the child is five miles away down the road but it's mm -hmm. it's something we we deliberately do but fail because you absolutely rely on the parents to step into the breach you know i don't think there's any but we've got 43 coaches and there isn't a single one who hasn't had a child at the club yeah because we'll take the time we'll just ask a quick comment from ryan and then we'll we'll wrap this up yeah um I've had some students who have done some work on this, mature students who have been parent coaches. Um, their whole reason for coaching the team is to spend more time with their child quite often. So I think it's really difficult um, to try and separate that. Having said that, I've done that myself with my own son's team and it is brilliant. It's fantastic not to be the parent coach. Um, I would say very quickly, under-researched, misunderstood, um, and the network can get very small when you're in the centre of an argument. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So, so great, great questions, uh, great response. And again, I mean, more, more broadly around this, we've just, I think we've, we've progressed the, the discussion around grassroots football a little bit further today um, and created a few more ideas and a few more perspectives. Um, I know that Danny probably disappeared because he was conscious that. He, this report he's going to be doing on behalf of the collective for the government is getting big. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, giving me, it's giving me some good ideas. So <laughs> every it's week good. it's getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. So it's going to be three thousand words of just people's names in support of the submission. Yeah, it's going to be a three thousand word report with a hundred thousand word appendix. I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever longest footnote. Well, but, but brilliant. Listen. Um, uh, Ryan, Andy, Anthony, um, and everyone who's joined us, thank, thanks so, so much for your time and for sharing your, your insights. Loads of, loads of questions and, and loads of ideas for people to pick up the, uh, the challenge and, and carry out some of this research. I wish you well for the rest of your day. I, I, will, I will speak to you all soon. Thank you. Cheers, Dan. Cheers, thanks Cheers a lot. folks. Cheers. Take care. Yeah.